on. So, all right. Um, the next two weeks, uh, we're switching topics uh, somewhat uh, to talk about uh, issues of film analysis and mass media vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Holocaust or the representation of the Holocaust. We'll spend uh, today and Thursday talking about Schindler's List, and we'll spend uh, Tuesday and Thursday of next week talking about Claude Lanzmann's film Shoah. Um, I will. We have screenings outside of classes for both of these films, so hopefully you came or try. I saw the film already. Um, either last night we screened it here. Um, the film is also available in the. Uh, Media Powell um, Media Lab, and you can go there whenever they're open, check out the film, you can view it within Powell. It is a three-hour film, so you should allocate yourself enough time. Um, it'll be on, it's on reserve now, it's been on reserve, and the same thing with uh, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah. The sections from Shoah that you'll be responsible for are also in the course reader, so you'll be able to find exactly the particular segments that I'll, I'll want you to watch. Because Monday is a holiday next week, um, I'm not scheduling the outside film screening on that day. Um, instead, it'll actually be scheduled on, on Tuesday. I'll um, change the syllabus uh, when I go back to my office today to reflect that. Um, and the film screening, by the way, will not be in this room. It'll actually be in Dodd, uh, which is the art history room, uh, Dodd 147. It'll also be at 7 o'clock. Uh, this is Tuesday. Uh, yeah, I believe it's Tuesday the 16th. Um, it may be Wednesday, but in any case, I'll make sure I put that up there. Um, if in the meantime you want to watch the film or the parts that you, of Shoah that um, you'll be responsible for, like I said, the film is also on reserve uh, in the Media Lab uh, in Powell. There's some parts of the film that are on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, well, I don't know, unfortunately, there's not a number, there's not a lot of parts that are on YouTube, um, but the parts that I found that I think are relevant, uh, or that are relevant for us, I've put here. And those will be the ones that concern us the first day. Um, there is a paper due, response paper, not this, um, not this Friday, but rather next Friday. And it'll be on either um, Schindler's List or on Shoah. So it's already posted. That's uh, ready to go. Um, just in terms of looking forward, by the way, in terms of where we're going, finally, week eight, uh, we'll be turning to issues around uh, trials, particularly trials of justice, genocide trials. Um, starting with the Nuremberg trials and then also discussing uh, the Auschwitz trials, uh, which are the basis of a short play uh, that you'll be reading from the course reader um, by a guy named Peter Weiss uh, called The Investigation. Um, we'll also go back to Samantha Power um, again and talk about some of the contemporary valences uh, of trying people uh, for the crimes against humanity. Um, this date is more or less confirmed where we'll have a Holocaust survivor come to class um, and discuss her experiences. And so I'll update more information about her background and, uh, and a little bit of preparation about uh, the discussion that will ensue that day. Um, then we only have two weeks after that. Um, there's a number of other uh, issues that we'll talk about, particularly this issue of transgenerational memory, which is memory across generations, um, and look at a contemporary German novel called The Reader, um, different than The Course Reader. Uh, for our class, this is a novel, and, um, and a couple other things. Finally, in week 10, we look at other victims of the Nazi genocide and, uh, and broaden our, our perspective once again. So that's where we're going. We're uh, essentially at the halfway point at, at this point in the class. And um, midterms, we have them. Uh, we're working on them. You'll probably get them back. I wouldn't say it'll be done this Friday, probably by next Friday. Um, there's a lot that has to happen in terms of coordinating the grading of them. And I take a look at all the exams uh, after the TAs make a pass. So that's where we are. Um, good. So today uh, we're talking about uh, Oscar Schindler. And um, this is, uh, I, I've lectured on the film uh, uh, numerous times, and I've also seen it numerous times. And hopefully you had a chance at least to see it, maybe for the first time last night. Uh, or if you had seen it before, maybe when you were in uh, high school or earlier. Um, the film, you may know, came out, uh, now it's relatively dated, and it's, it's now, I can't believe, uh, 17 years. Uh, it came out in 93. Uh, 1993, it won uh, the Best Picture that year, and uh, has, in some ways, has a status that, that it's bigger than the film itself. That is to say, uh, when people, at least in 
contemporary culture who may not know much about the Holocaust uh, talk about the Holocaust, they can usually reference that film. Uh, they usually know that there is this film by Steven Spielberg called Schindler's List. Um, they know something about the fact that he saved Jews, that he was a, a righteous, so to speak, righteous Gentile or even righteous Nazi, uh, since he was a card-carrying member of the Nazi party. Um, and they know something about the story. Um, and it's largely because uh, the film, well, one, the film had such an impact. Um, the timing of the film was interesting, too. It came at the same year that the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. opened. Uh, so this is a very significant building, a very important museum and monument on American soil uh, commemorating uh, the victims of the, of the Holocaust. And uh, it's a kind of a, a shift, I think, in American relationship to the Holocaust. Um, it's interesting that this film and the museum are here in the United States. That is to say, the film was made, obviously, in Hollywood. The museum is located in D.C., and most of the people who visit the museum are themselves, um, you know, they have a certain amount of distance uh, to the Holocaust, if not just because of the fact they're living here in the United States. Um, this is uh, part of the point that generations, uh, generations come and go, uh, new generations come about, and issues of how they learn about the Holocaust is primarily through the way in which it's represented. So how it's represented in museum exhibitions, how it's represented in popular culture, uh, in film, and, you know, quite honestly, I would put um, Inglorious Bastards, uh, Quentin Tarantino's film, kind of in the same thing, is that, you know, when you ask people how do they know about Nazis or what, what's your impression of Nazis, well, it's very much uh, dictated by popular culture and the way in which we uh, consume films, um, representations that, you know, have some basis in historical reality, but at the same time take many liberties in the historical record some of which um, were liberties that stretched the way in which we relate to the, these events. I mean, to tell a, to a black comedy about uh, Nazis is itself already like playing with questions of generic convention, right? So um, to represent, uh, and then to kind of think about the way in which you have this almost redemptive history where the Jews are the ones killing the Nazis uh, in Quentin Tarantino's film is a kind of way of dealing with the past that is obviously not true to the historical record, but it kind of makes us, from our perspective, I think, actually feel good, um, which is, uh, is, is kind of confirmed by the fact that almost every time the film's been shown, crowds, you know, cheer at the end, you know, we're glad that Nazis have finally been burned and killed and violated and, you know, mowed down in a, in a kind of, you know, massive violent conflagration, which is how, of course, Inglorious Bastards ends. Um, if you haven't seen the film, sorry, I ruined the ending for you, but that's it. Uh, Nazis are blown up and, and, uh, and burned. Uh, it's, 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 and how, somehow, we feel good about this. Uh, and there's a certain sense of kind of vindication. Um, it largely, I think, has to do with the perspective that we have, uh, that is to say, our perspective decades after the events that we're talking about, a sense of justice that we have, uh, a sense of kind of poetic justice, perhaps, uh, a sense of kind of playing with the historical record, maybe distorting certain things, but also trying to make a kind of point, often an emotional point. And I think Spielberg Schindler's List does, um, in, in a di very different way, some of the same things. It's a, it's a highly emotional film. Uh, if you saw the film, uh, there's almost, it, it may be three hours long, a little longer than that. It's very difficult to get up from it. Uh, we're attached to the film. It has a very profound emotional effect. And I think, honestly, I mean, Inglorious Bastards has an emotional effect too. It's a different emotional effect. It's emotional effect, I think, of a kind of happy uh, celebration catharsis um, and a sort of, I don't know, a, a kind of distancing effect of how funny, uh, but yeah, they deserved it. Um, Schindler's List has an effect as well, which is a tremendously, I think, um, deeply emotional connection with the victims, but also an identification with, um, with Schindler as a person who's redeemed himself. Uh, that is to say, a Nazi who has actually gone through this self-transformation and become a different person. And we, from our perspective, um, can identify with him as a hero, uh, as someone who definitely did do something that was significant, noteworthy, important, should be celebrated, and should have a film you know, made about him. Um, I would add that Irina Sendler did something uh, perhaps uh, even more remarkable, and, uh, and it's true, Spielberg didn't make a film about her. Um, in any case, uh, 
we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about film analysis today. That is to say, we're actually going to look at the way in which the film is structured as a film in order to convey um, these historical events. We're going to talk about the kinds of representational techniques that Spielberg makes use of. So there will be a certain amount of film analysis that we'll be doing. We'll also talk about the historical events themselves. That is to say, what's represented in, these, in, the, in the film. So uh, with regard to Schindler himself, I put a couple of web links uh, on the, for the class. And um, a few things that I just want to say just by way of introduction. Um, Oscar Schindler, I mean, sometimes is called this unlikely hero uh, because he was someone who directly benefited by the rise of the Nazi party. He benefited because uh, financially. Um, he was also in a privileged position. That is to say, he wasn't Jewish. Um, he was a German uh, living in Czechoslovakia. He was an industrialist. He had factories. He was relatively wealthy, um, someone who lost a, a, a lot of his wealth during the war, um, but also someone in a position, a kind of ambiguous position of power. That is to say, someone who could mediate, you might say, between German Nazis and Jewish victims. And this kind of mediation or going back and forth is really at the heart of the film, right? At, at what point does Schindler move from this kind of picture here, which is him with uh, SS officers celebrating his birthday, to the picture of Schindler working with and saving uh, Jewish victims um, in one of his factories. So it's this kind of mediation, uh, this almost privileged site of contact between perpetrators and victims that, that Schindler occupies. And it's a profoundly uh, ambiguous space, it's a profoundly tenuous space, and it's certainly one that's, uh, that has, I think, a certain kind of, um, it takes a certain kind of person with a, a, a certain amount of risk taking to occupy. Uh, that is to say, it wasn't uh, easy, I don't think, to do. Um, in any case, um, he's someone that uh, survived the war. Um, Oscar Schindler's story itself was fairly well uh, known after the war. In fact, uh, he was uh, honored, uh, he is honored now today at Yad Vashem, which is uh, the Holocaust memorial site in Israel. Um, he died in 1974, um, having gone through a significant number of personal and financial uh, ups, upheavals uh, after the war. Um, but it is well known that he did save 1,100 Jews from Auschwitz and Gross Rosen, which were two concentration camps. It is known that his direct effort to intervention resulted in the saving of these Jews. And this is the story that, um, that and the person that Spielberg wants to, um, wants to celebrate. A um, couple of uh, just maps to sort of orient us in the location that we're, what we're talking about here. Um, this is Krakow. Krakow is um, in Poland, uh, relatively close to Auschwitz um, in the southern part of Poland, close to the German border. Um, had a Jewish, fairly large Jewish population, um, numbering in the tens of thousands um, prior to the war. Also, like Vilna and other cities that we've looked at, had a very large cultural history uh, of Jews stretching back for uh, centuries. Um, and this is something that, in that very famous speech that Amon Gert gives in, 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 the, in this film, uh, he recognizes the history of the cultural contributions that Jews had had to Krakow. Um, and in many ways, this is something that was um, completely uh, destroyed. Um, the main train station runs through the city center. Um, Schindler's factory, uh, the enamelware factory, was located here, just across the railway tracks from the ghetto. The ghetto, uh, as the case with just almost every other major city and small cities as well, was an enclosed small area where Jews were um, all squished into. Uh, generally, the situation of the ghetto was always uh, malnutrition, hunger, starvation, desperation, hiding, um, moving into a very enclosed space. And this is, um, you might remember when I talked about Irina Sendler and the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, she had made, um, you know, move back and forth between the ghetto and the greater population. Um, this kind of movement uh, in and out of the ghetto was relatively rare, um, especially when it came to like smuggling people out. Um, when the decision was made to evacuate the ghetto, um, most of the people uh, were either shot or deported to concentration camps, either the work camp, uh, which was located just outside the city center, where Amon Gert uh, was the commandant, uh, or others uh, deported to Auschwitz, uh, most of whom were killed. 
Um, so this all happens in the period of 1942 to 1945. Um, here's the, yeah, the campus here. Uh, the, trail, the railway station lines that lead to Auschwitz, which is not far away at all. Um, it's, uh, it's probably um, less than a 30 to 40 minute uh, ride. It's, uh, it's pretty close. There's a couple other maps just to orient yourself in the historical area. This would be the region of the, uh, of the ghetto itself. Uh, relatively, again, relatively small, enclosed by barbed wire. Um, horrific conditions inside there. And the evacuation of the ghetto, which takes place um, in the film, is overseen, um, overseen by, um, by Gert, but also literally seen by Schindler as he's up on a hill looking down at the ghetto and sees this moment uh, of uh, the chaos that ensues as the ghetto is, is evacuated. Um, the camp itself, um, this is the structure of the, pop in a second, this is the structure of the, of the camp uh, where Gert is the, um, in charge. Again, it's a relatively small area, enclosed again by barbed wire. It has a crematorium in the corner here. It has a roll call, call square in the center. Um, and this is, is all outside, so exposed to the elements, uh, as you saw in the film. Tremendous cold, snow, prisoners who were actually forced to build parts of the camp as well, um, which kind of calls up the same kind of uh, work uh, that, that Ceylon talked about in, in Death Fugue. So all this is based upon historical reality. None of this is, none of this is a stretch. None of this is imagined. imagined. Um, these camps did exist. Krakow was evacuated um, pretty much uh, as, as you saw in the film. He, um, Spielberg didn't take a lot of historical liberties in the depiction of the broad historical events that are, that are depicted there. Um, there are things that, are, that didn't actually happen. I mean, just to say a couple, I mean, there was no sorting out of people's teeth uh, in railway stations, uh, as was depicted at one point in the film. Um, we don't know of times when showers that looked as if they were going to gas people actually produced water. Uh, another time, which in the film plays a very important emotional role of kind of causing us to think something horrific is going to happen. We're going to watch people gassed at this moment. Um, but in fact, the film doesn't show that. The film doesn't show the gassing of women uh, in Auschwitz. Rather, it shows this kind of uh, moment of purification uh, where water comes out instead. Um, we'll talk about that scene on Thursday, but I wanted to say that that's it's somewhat of a stretch uh, historically. Um, and it's something that Spielberg, I think, does uh, largely for an emotional effect that it creates in the film. All right. Um, other things. Uh, I do want to say something about the actual, the victims themselves, the Schindler Jews. Um, this is a, a list, uh, actually, of, the, of all the Jews that he saved, every single one. Um, and it's an interesting list if you had a chance to look at it. What it says up here is, uh, this is their religion, so J-U is, is Yuda, Jew. Their nationality, almost, um, not all, but many are Polish, which is P-O. Um, others are Czech, um, others are, are Hungarian, uh, but for the most part, they're Polish. Um, last name, first name, date of birth, which is written day, month, year. Uh, so this would be October 28, 1912. Um, and then occupation uh, over here. It's all in German, obviously, but uh, what you find is that most are sort of, um, most are um, workers. Uh, that is to say, um, cooks, uh, table makers, uh, metal factory worker, painter, um, yeah, table maker, um, metal workers, um, basically people who, are, who have uh, some ability to work uh, in a factory or have worked with their hands. Um, what's extraordinary as you see this list is really just looking at the length. I mean, honestly, just scrolling down and seeing these people were all by name uh, written on a list that was typed out, uh, that was used to identify them, and they were specifically saved at the express will of Oscar Schindler. And that in itself uh, is remarkable. I mean, that itself is worth, you know, talking about, it's worth thinking about. Um, it's a pretty long list, and it's pretty, and we know that had Schindler not intervened in the way he did, 
it's very likely that many of these people would have been killed uh, in the process of either malnutrition or starvation or sent to um, gas chambers themselves. So that's, uh, this is the, these are the historical people. Um, in the film as well, and I think the film is interesting for, one, for a number of reasons that we're talking about, is that it's, one, it's a kind of depiction of a historical event that takes us back. That is to say, it's almost what you would call a historical recreation, right? The sense of we're going to watch something that unfolded in history and we're made to see it. Uh, we're, we're essentially seeing it staged in front of us. Um, this is partially why he chooses to do the film in black and white, right? To give it a sense of kind of historical authenticity, a sense of you're going back in time and you're sort of taking this time travel and we're seeing these events unfold before our eyes and we're seeing them unfold in kind of a global dimension. That is to say, it's not just about Oscar Schindler and his single decision or his relationship with Stern or his tense relationship with Amon Gert, but it's also the implications, the broader implications of what the context is of everything that's going on. And so Schindler's List is also a film in many ways about the Holocaust, right? It's also about something broader than just the list and just Schindler himself, right? I mean, Spielberg is staging this as something that stands in for something bigger. Um, but the film is not just a historical recreation, and I think this is also important to say, and it largely has to do with these framing moments in the film about how we enter into this history, uh, the moments of color, uh, which actually frame the film. The moments of color at the very beginning, where we see um, a group of Jews saying uh, in prayer, uh, where we see the candles and these other uh, motifs and symbolic motifs that are introduced, and the very end of the film, where you have the connection between the actors and actresses in the film with the historical victims themselves. Right? This doesn't happen very often in films. We don't see uh, this kind of union between the people who played historical people and the people themselves, right? So in a way, Schindler, uh, Schindler's List is also a film that's trying to say something about its own reality, right? This is, uh, it's not just, uh, this is not make up, made, make believe. Um, this is not just a film in terms of just a representation. It's connected deeply to the people who uh, were involved. And it's that connection at the end between the people who played the historical actors and the historical actors that has this kind of legitimizing um, effect. All right. So talk a little bit about, um, I want to say a couple of things about film analysis. Um, let me, I'll just go. My old version of, of PowerPoint, I can't skip to the slide. I have to go through them. So let's see. We are here. Introductory film analysis. Um, I'm going to tell you a couple of uh, terms that I want to talk about. Um, I'll uh, encourage you to stay awake, uh, even though the lights are off. And I think it's important to have, in the same way that we talked about poetry, in terms of sort of like some uh, techniques to analyze poetry, we want to also have the available techniques to talk about film especially a film as crafted as Schindler's List. And Schindler's List is an extraordinarily crafted film. Uh, Spielberg played an immensely um, detailed role in directing every scene, every camera movement, every sound, every connection between scenes, um, and to create an entire effect uh, that the film has, a, a very deep emotional effect. So when we talk about film analysis, there's a couple of terms we need to know or be familiar with starting with just talking about shots. Uh, shots here referring to simply a continuous film sequence. So a shot is what the camera does uh, on something. Um, there are different kinds of shots. Some are shots, what we call establishing shots, meaning they establish um, essentially a situation. These establishing shots tend to be broader or bigger, but they could also be close-ups. Um, in a sense, the establishing shot focused on the flame of the camera is an establishing shot because it establishes a kind of uh, symbolic um, light motif that runs throughout the entire film. Um, Close-up shots we're familiar with on faces or on buildings or on details. Um, reverse shots, meaning shots where you see something and then you see the opposite. Shot, reverse shot. Uh, lots of these in the film where you see, um, you see Schindler looking, right? And then you see what he's looking at. 
You see Schindler's face? You see what he's looking at. Uh, that's a shot reverse shot. Extremely common because we're often put in the perspective of Oscar Schindler in this film. That is to say, we're often given a view of what he's seeing. Um, and the idea is we're almost meant to embody his gaze. Right? So it's, it has only to do with the way in which Spielberg is filming the film. If he only, you only saw Schindler looking and didn't see what he's looking at, uh, it wouldn't have quite the same effect. So we'll pay attention to those things. Then the film makes tons of use of tracking shots. Tracking shots are when the camera is moving, uh, following people, moving around, uh, the camera that goes inside of rooms, the camera that's moving along streets, the camera that's tracing people's steps. Um, the camera that's uh, on the move rather than the camera that's still looking at something. The camera that moves, that jiggles, uh, but also the camera that follows and tracks. Um, and then you have something which is similar to establishing shots, uh, panorama shots, shots that give an entire range of views. Uh, essentially, panorama meaning all seeing or something that sees uh, a wider area than what the human eye is capable of seeing. We see about maybe 170 degrees, maybe close to 180. So panorama shots tend to see more than that. Um, these shots often have not just a revealing sense of seeing uh, much more, like what's all around you, but they also can create a sort of vertigo effect, a kind of dizziness, uh, because it's not the way that human beings see. We don't see in 360 degrees. All right. Uh, scenes. Uh, scenes are composed of shots. Uh, scenes are like the scene in which the ghetto was evacuated. So there's lots of different shots that take place. In aggregate, that's a scene. Uh, they're cut and spliced together. Sometimes, and one of the things that Spielberg does a lot in this film, is a very rapid cutting and splicing. So sometimes you only have a shot that lasts maybe a second or two seconds, and then it's on to something else, and then it's on to something else, and something else, something else. And it's up to us as viewers to kind of link them together and sort of see the connections. Um, how are they connected together? Well, it could be two different events taking place at the same time, right? So a shot that shows, you know, the inside of an apartment, and then next you see outside, you know, in the ghetto, and then you see in the street, and then you see back in the apartment again. And the idea is they're not obviously physically connected, but they're all happening at the same time. So we have a sense of, yeah, a scene composed of different shots that have been spliced together. This has a kind of effect of what you would call sort of a montage. Um, montage uh, can be where you have different, um, different shots on top of one another as a kind of uh, almost like overlaid on each other. But more so the case in, in, Schind in Schindler's List, you have sort of what I would call non-contiguous spaces and discontinuous times spliced together as if contiguous or continuous. What this means is the spaces are not physically connected together. So it's like I see the outside of a building, I see the concentration camp, I see, I don't know, the inside of Gert's apartment, and all within, say, two seconds or three seconds. So it's like shot, 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 but they're discontinuous in a sense, but they're put together as if continuous. Um, this effect often is, is used continuously. I'll show you examples of this, but throughout the film it's used to show the kind of the greaterness of the story. So rather than just focusing on Schindler himself and his where he is and what he's seeing, it's often seeing things that are also going on that Schindler himself can't see. And Spielberg does this by essentially a montage technique. Um, yeah, Motif symbols. Um, Spielberg's film is entirely governed by, I think, uh, deep symbolism that runs throughout the film. Uh, symbolism of things like the candles, uh, the smoke, uh, people's hands, uh, the, uh, the emphasis on hands, because hands do things, right? Hands grasp things, hands touch people, hands caress, hands shake, hands can shoot, hands can administer drugs, um, hands. I mean, tremendously kind of these tremendous number of close-ups on what people's hands are doing, hands type. Uh, it's a leitmotif that runs throughout the film. Um, and I think fire is the other one. Uh, candles, candles as prayer, candles um, that commemorate issues of memory. Uh, and also, of course, fire destroys, uh, fire burns, uh, crematoria, and the smoke coming out of a train is, is also examples of fire. There are probably others. Uh, there are probably plenty of others. Um, but these are kind of motifs that he introduces that run throughout the film. Um, the little girl in the red is an example of a motif. I mean, we follow her for a very brief period of time. 
Uh, we see her. It's a, an interesting intrusion of color into the black and white film. Um, but she functions, it's not so much just the little girl in the red, but she functions in some ways much greater as all the children, all the victims, right? Here's one victim, but she stands for thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, perhaps millions. Um, and so these symbols are much greater than just, you know, just things on the screen. Um, the framing of the film. Um, the story is framed in, I think, a really interesting way that has to do with, honestly, the intrusion of color and black and white. The film starts off in color and ends in color. And throughout the film, there's only a couple of other instances where color comes in. Uh, it comes in with the little girl in the red uh, when the ghetto is being evacuated. And it comes in as well through the candles. Uh, it comes in through the candles at different points. Other than that, I don't remember any other moments where color comes in. Am I, am I wrong about that? Is there? Right. That's right. Yeah, there is, exactly. So that, that, that's an example of this, this motif that comes back much later. And it's really, you know, for us, it's like it doesn't need any other explanation, right? It doesn't need any explanation. We connect it back to the little girl in the red that we saw hiding. I mean, of course, the embodiment of, of innocence, of youth, of purity, and the sense that, you know, all that has been extinguished. Um, so those are the moments where the color intrudes into the film, but intrudes in a way that I think is deeply, um, makes a deep emotional connection for the, for the viewer. Um, the rest of it is told in black and white, and I think largely in a sense here because of the sense of trying to create a historical, um, a, a sense of going back in time, right? A sense of a kind of historical authenticity that's connected with using black and white. Um, this authenticity is important because, again, he is referring to, he's based upon a real story, it is an authentic person, it's not made up, and so the black and white, in a sense, is giving more credence uh, to that. Now, to be sure, the way the film is structured, uh, it's a representation that gives us uh, insight into this historical story, and it's a, it's a very um, deeply, I said, deeply crafted uh, uh, piece, deeply crafted to create certain emotional effects uh, for viewers, and also to give us an understanding of, of the complexity of the events it's about. So I would say the black and white is connected to this reality effect, effect of being there. And I think it has to do with us um, being, as we watched it, being what I call over here, and this is a fa relatively, it's not just me, this is uh, in film theory a, a pretty common term, us viewers being sutured to the film, literally like tied to it, literally connected, right? Um, it's not like something that we, as you watch this film, I think it's probably fairly hard to be distracted uh, because as the story unfolds, we are emotionally connected to it on very deep levels. Um, we're sutured to the film, we're connected to it, we identify with certain characters, and we're also repelled by others. Um, if you think back to the film Conspiracy, for example, where we watched the Vonsay Conference, essentially, that's another historical recreation, but I I'm positive you didn't have the same emotional effect connection to that film. Uh, I don't think anyone was, I, I could watch the film and say, gosh, I felt such empathy to these characters. I was deeply connected with them. I identified with them. I really felt something as I watched this. If anything, we felt repelled and kind of distant from them as we watched uh, this very mechanical, calculating uh, conference take place. And Schindler's List does exactly the opposite. It's exactly about identification and connection uh, with, um, with Schindler, with Stern, but with the broader panorama of victims and a kind of repellent. And, and then, of course, you need this counterpoint, and the counterpoint is, is Gert. And the counterpoint is Gert to provide us a baseline for also understanding the opposite of attraction. So that's repulsion. Um, the gaze. Um, this is something I already mentioned with the shot, reverse shot thing. Uh, this is extremely common in, the, in film, but also extremely common in, in Schindler's List, where we see what the characters are seeing, right? So we watch Schindler doing the looking. This sense of us seeing like he sees. Uh, this is we follow their gaze. Um, then there's this issue, these two last things go together because sound is something which is absolutely critical in this film. There's, uh, this is a film that I think in some ways the soundtrack um, 
and I don't mean just the musical soundtrack, I mean all the noises that we hear in the film are absolutely critical for understanding the film. It's almost as if um, when the film was created, the kind of the clanking on things on the table, the kind of the picking up of the pen, the stamping of people's passports, uh, the typing on the typewriter, these sounds are highlighted to produce an effect that he's really focusing, Spielberg, really focusing on uh, what it means, uh, what it is that this object is doing. And it's not just about seeing that object, it's about hearing that object. It's hearing the keys of the typewriter hit the paper. There's that moment where the sounds are really very accentuated. Um, and there's also, there is the musical soundtrack. There are parts where music intervenes in the film. There's sounds uh, of children singing at various points. There are sounds uh, of, uh, of uh, classical music being played. Uh, there's sounds of disjuncture, right, where the ghetto's being evacuated and you hear uh, the music and these two Nazis come in. Is that, is that Bach? No, it's Beethoven. Uh, and there's this kind of thuggish discussion that they have as the music goes on in the back, the shots are being fired in the ghetto, and you have this way in which the bullet sounds are intersecting with the musical sounds, intersecting with voices, and all this, again, has been very carefully crafted uh, in order to convey... Um, what may have been the impression of the ghetto being evacuated. Um, two other technical things I want to mention, because this is also something that Spielberg makes extreme use of in the film, is what we call diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound. Diegetic sound simply is sound that is emanating from what you're seeing. Like you basically see people on the screen talking and you hear them. Like what you see is actually also what you hear. Um, it's not sound coming from somewhere off the screen. Non-diegetic sound happens outside of what you're seeing. So, for example, when we see the ghetto being evacuated and we hear children singing, we don't know where those children are, right? We don't actually see them on the screen singing. And, in fact, uh, this non-diegetic sound largely produces in us a kind of, I think, an emotional effect of, you know, this is something that's, this is, it's almost a sort of, uh, a sort of tension, I suppose, it produces uh, by not knowing uh, who these people are who are singing and yet having this kind of musical background sound that's in many ways very dissonant with what we're seeing, right? So there's this kind of dissonance becomes a part of the a way in which the film is, I think, effective. All right, so those are my introduction to film analysis. These terms are all going to come up as we look at certain, um, some scenes and we'll sort of see the way in which this happens and uh, we'll spend you know, the next bit talking about. Um, so, turn all this off. Now this is the point where I hope that I actually can show you something. Hello. So, you have to bear with it for a moment because it's uh, extremely, it's somewhat slow. Um, and it has to, and when I go to different scenes, by the way, because it's on two sides of the DVD, I have to flip it over, and it's going to take time, so you'll just be, we'll be perfectly patient as we do this. Okay, yeah, we'll start here. Let's just stop right there. But a couple of things, and this kind of goes to that uh, first issue that I talked about. The establishing, here I'd say that the candle is sort of an establishing shot in the entire film. 
And that does this not because of the grandness of the space it shows, but actually because of the enclosure of the space it shows. Starting with a very domestic space, a private space, uh, people just uh, saying prayer, uh, uh, Sabbath prayer, and um, the focus on the candle, right? This candle being obviously part of the ritual, but also connected with something. There's an issue of temporality connected with the candle. As the candle burns down, it's at the moment the candle's extinguished, right, that the smoke from the candle uh, becomes uh, melded with the smoke from a train. Now, all this is to say, this is not to say that this is made up, um, but it establishes certain kinds of motifs that are going to flow throughout the film. Right? As soon as we see the very first train with the whistle here, we know because of our perspective of, um, you know, from the class, from our knowledge of history, trains uh, signify something, especially large trains like that. We're already thinking in our mind, you know, deportation. Right? These trains are already calling up a certain kind of knowledge that we have. And the connection here between something very industrial, large, potentially violent, and something between something very domestic, something private and closed. This becomes an important leitmotif of the film and is also sort of the basis of a very fundamental violation that happens, right? Um, the violation meaning of the sacred and private space. So that's the kind of the moment that we go back in history. It's that, that moment where you see the train, that's the moment that you are in 1942. That's the moment that you're, you're basically transported to the past, you're transported to black and white, and it begins with the image of the train, and it also begins with something didactic, because the film is also has an element, um, as much as I think it is probably in the genre of a, a, a mel historical melodrama, it's also a didactic film, because it's meant to instruct. It's telling us what was happening, uh, when the ghetto was uh, established, when the ghetto was evacuated, and so forth. Things that are connected to the historical record. There's a question. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's already a sense of a kind of alertness that we have when we come to the film, which, which is established right from the beginning, a kind of emotional heightened alertness uh, through the sounds, but also through the way in which the shots uh, are done. And it's something that, you know, I don't, I don't think this is over-interpreting, but you'll have to constantly look at the way in which objects are shown. Shots from above, shots from below, shots that show Schindler looking down, shots that show him looking up, um, shots of the Jews uh, often, you know, on the ground in a kind of more diminutive uh, type of space. These are all things that uh, are, are honestly quite critical for understanding um, this film. So I'm, fl I'm flipping the thing over, which is what's, what's happening here. I can't guarantee that this process of showing you these scenes is going to be seamless, but uh, I want to move to another um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, that'll just take a second, but it, it will come. I'm going to move to talking uh, a little bit about, so I, well, we established this issue of this light motif and stuff that's in the beginning. We talked about these framing moments. We need to talk about the, the characters themselves. Um, that is to say, we need to talk about the main characters, meaning uh, um, Amon Gert and, and Oscar Schindler. Uh -huh. Lovely. Good. Why I want to show you this uh, scene is because this is an uh, important moment where you sort of have that transformation that Schindler has gone through and this, kind of, this connection essentially between who is the hero of the film and the victim of the film trying to understand or negotiate, so to speak, uh, with one another. Um, one of the things, and this is so common in the film, I mean, the, the play of light and dark, the play of shadows on the figures, the play of interior spaces and exterior spaces, the camera inside, people looking from the inside out, people looking from the outside in. I mean, this is a very fundamental part of the way in which the film also kind of illustrates the tremendous violation uh, that had happened. So you have scenes like this, uh, which are you know, extremely, or, or shots like that, extremely artistic uh, in the way in which the shadows, the modulated shadow plays over his face. So just to set this up, this is the, 
seen just before they make the list uh, of Schindler, uh, of the Jews they're gonna, um, that Schindler's going to be able to save. And he's having a discussion with Goethe, uh, who can't understand why he wants these Jews. Um, it's an interesting scene for a couple reasons. One, it's, uh, you see we can do a little bit of character analysis here to understand their characters. Uh, who is Goethe? Who is um, Schindler? What they're trying to, how they interact with each other. We can understand it because of the architecture of the scene itself. As, they, as you'll see, they're in between windows and they only at the end come together. Um, and uh, yeah, let me, let me just play it for you and then we can talk about the characters. So. Just to stop it real quick, I mean, this is, uh, is so, it's so important how he crafts this. The camera is inside, looking outside, right? You have Gert on the one hand, you have Schindler on the other. You have this sort of architectural structure of where the window is. And they're coming back and forth, trying to negotiate something very historically significant, right? The people's lives are in the balance of this negotiation. And so that negotiation, as Spielberg presents it to us visually, is also a negotiation negotiation that's, uh, that's literally, you know, in a sense kind of cut uh, between these two characters. Um, so the way in which we see it uh, unfold. It's good for me. I know that. I'm familiar with them. I don't have to train them. It's good for you. I'll compensate. Yeah, that's right. It's good for the army. Yeah, of course. You know what I'm going to make? Well, a single chair. Well, everyone's making up the tank chairs. You need yeah. that. Everybody's happy. Everyone's happy except me. <laughs> I mean, you're probably scanning me somehow. If I'm making a hundred, you've got to be making three. Hmm? And if we're not making three, then it's four, I think. Somehow, I just told you. Not a bit, not a bit. Yeah, all right, don't tell me. I'll go along with it. It's just irritating, I can't work it out. Look, all you have to do is tell me what it's worth, really. What's the person worth? No, 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 no. What's the one that's worth to you? So that critical connection there, right, between the discussion, the music, uh, this absolutely kind of hinge-like question, right, the ethical question, at the core of the whole film, what's a person worth to you? Then connected immediately to the typing sound, right? So essentially, that question's answered at the very next moment where you, you transported from this discussion that they had uh, inside, outside, this kind of coming together of the villain, the hero, um, this fundamental ethical question at the core of the film, and then the typewriter. And this typewriter, this scene is extremely moving as well because of the closeness of the camera on the individual letters, right? So you're talking about people's names, people's names hanging in the destiny of just their name being typed on a list. And so this very relatively long scene now that ensues of watching every letter enter onto the page. The music, this would be non-diegetic music, meaning we don't know where it's coming from, but yet it produces an emotional effect of kind of uncertainty in us, right? Of the, the tenseness of the situation. So kind of contemplative. So look how close, the close-up here on these letters, the fragmentation, right? I mean, it's a kind of this moment of inscription. I mean, this is, you know, the book of life in some ways. Yeah. And just to go to the next scene really quickly here, so we're running out of time. Here you have now going from the letters to the people, right? From the individual letters that make up the names to the people who are there. Very, you know, very emotional scene as well, right? Where you see like, okay, this is the reality.
So, I mean, another leitmotif that runs throughout the film would have to be this issue of writing, inscription, names, letters, right? The idea that this is a list, after all. And so, the focus on the typewriter, the focus on the inscription of the names, the names on lists, the names that Nazis made lists, roll call lists, these are lists of people being saved, right? So it's almost like an inversion. This is not the Nazi roll call outside, you know, in the wilderness. This is the roll call of people who get to be saved um, by, by Schindler himself. The close-ups on their faces, I mean, consistently, right? We're meant to, it's very humanized, right? This is not just, these are not abstracted names. These are people with children. They're old people. They're young people. They're people, obviously, with stars on their, bat, you know, st wearing stars of David. They're numbered. And they're haggard, they're tired, and these close-ups on their faces meant to definitely humanize this. In a sense, the black and white, I mean, it's almost as if we're seeing a photograph from history. But yet, it's not that. Right? It has the effect as if we're seeing something historical. Um, this is, uh, I mean, these scenes, these kind of mob scenes of people boarding trains, uh, you know, to work, to deportation, to slave camps, and so forth. Um, based on photographs that we have, um, many taken by Nazis, of, uh, of what deportations um, look like. So it's like that whole kind of visual archive that we have in our heads is also kind of enhanced and confirmed um, in v different ways by the film. All right. So now I have to switch back to the other side. So <laughs> it'll take a second. But uh, let's see. Bear with me as I do that. It would be nice if it just sort of seamlessly worked, but it doesn't seamlessly work. So just a characterization. I mean, one thing that I didn't get to talk about, but as this loads, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, to characterization of Schindler versus Gert, uh, in that scene that we saw, we sort of saw this moment of them coming together, a kind of negotiation. If you had to talk about Gert in terms of uh, who he is, what kind of qualities or characters describe him, I mean, what, what kind of things would come to mind? You would say, character, just a characterization of Goethe. What kind? Unsophisticated. unsophisticated. I mean, certain kind of, uh, compared yeah. To compared to Schindler, certainly unsophisticated. Um, what else is he compared to Schindler? What else is he? Violent? Okay, sure, violent, yeah. I mean, he's a camp commandant after all. He's sadistic. He shoots people. Uh, yeah, what else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly selfish, bitter, um, yeah, cold, calculating. I mean, in many ways, very sim more similar to the men that we see in the Vance Conference film, but I think depicted with more, um, with somewhat more uh, personal qualities, because we see him for longer, obviously. Yeah. I mean, affected by his emotion, um, that he was trying to like act out this idea of pardoning people, and right when he got pissed off, basically he just he looked at his paintbrush and shot some boy. Um, so he's very uh, easily emotionally affected by. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of capricious as well, right? I mean, sort of unpredictable. Uh, not exactly steady. Um, sure. This, yeah, what else? Absolutely. I mean, kind of power obsessed. What about Schindler in comparison? I mean, because the two need one another. It's almost like they're, they're, they're deeply connected to each other. I mean, it's not just that Schindler's the inverse, but they, in some ways, they both were two possibilities spawned, I mean, both were card-carrying Nazis. One ended up like Gert, one ended up like Schindler. So at that point of divergence, I mean, what, how does Schindler compare as a, as a person? Mm. Right, I mean, this kind of char uh, charisma, it doesn't help, or it doesn't hurt that he's uh, played uh, by a very good-looking actor. Uh, um, doesn't help, you know, I mean, it's something that kind of we as viewers identify with him. He's uh, has a sort of, even if he is a Nazi, we, at the, the beginning we still, we still like him. I mean, he's not unlikable. What else about him? He's what? Continental. Continental, meaning what? Well, he has a, like a, uh, an aristocratic 
Mm -hmm. He's smooth. He's smooth. Yeah, I like that. He's smooth. <laughs> he is, he's smooth. I think that's right. He also plays his cards very slow. He's a, he's a poker player. Mm -hmm. He's strategic. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly very strategic. Um, and it's certainly that recognition of where he can insert himself and do certain things, which in fact was probably the basis of how um, he could carry out something like this. Um, does he change fundamentally in the film? Does Gert change fundamentally in the film? I mean, there's a kind of stasis about the character of Gert, I would say. I mean, he doesn't... There's no kind of moment of self-awareness or transformation or kind of recognition of what's going on. But I mean, there is that, of course, very key moment uh, where the decisions made by Schindler to put together this list. I mean, this, this transformative moment. I mean, the character grows. The character evolves. And in many ways, this is also why I think we identify with him, not only because of his charisma and the fact that he's smooth, but that he can become a better person, right? He can do something. He can do something that puts his own life at risk. He can do something redemptive. And it's the very fact that Gert never does anything redeeming uh, in the film that makes him so difficult uh, to identify with, so, so repellent uh, as a person. And yet the two of them are kind of counterpoints um, to, each, to each other. So that's uh, the scene I'm going to show you is actually Gert. Uh, this is uh, the scene that he's uh, talking about the, um, the coming evacuation of the ghetto. And what's amazing about this scene is not just uh, that he's uh, articulating this historical action, but it's the way in which Spielberg puts this scene together. Um, it's, a, it's a beautifully crafted scene in which you have an acoustic event, which is the speech that he says, today is history. You might remember that, today is history. Uh, this acoustic event that frames the entire uh, scene. So it starts with today is history, it ends with today is history, and then as he gives this speech, the camera's in many different places. The camera's not on Gert talking. We hear Gert talking, but the camera goes other places. It goes to Schindler. It goes to the inside of uh, a, a Jewish family. It goes outside to the setting up of the, um, the roll call. The camera travels to many different places, and you have this amazing disjuncture between what we're hearing and what we're seeing, but yet we also know that what we're seeing is deeply connected to what we're hearing. So you'll have to watch, I'm going to play it a couple of times, because it's such a, I mean, in many ways, such a beautifully crafted scene, but it has a certain effect uh, of, uh, I think, conveying the, the, the true grandness uh, of what's about to happen. I mean, grandness in, in the worst you know, sense. So it's this scene here. Uh, let's see, I can make this a tiny bit bigger. Uh, actually, I'll stop for just a second. So um, I'm going to turn this up. So you listen to the voice starting. And even what's interesting about as this scene starts, um, it actually starts not on Gert himself. And so this is another example of that non-diegetic sound. So what we're seeing is not the person speaking. Right? The person speaking is someone else off scene. And immediately we realize who it is. We realize it's Gert. It's not Schindler talking. Uh, yet that's who we see. So just let's see. So I'll start in one second, just after this. So here, that's where it starts. Off scene voice. Today will be remembered. Years from now, the young will ask with wonder about this day. Today is history, and you are part of it. 600 years ago, when elsewhere they were putting the blame for the Black Death, Kevin S. the Great spoke for us told the Jews they could come to Krakow. They came. They trundled their belongings into the city. They settled. They took hold. They prospered. In business, science, education, the arts. They came here with nothing. Nothing. And they loved it. For six centuries, there has been a Jewish Krakow. Think about that. By this evening,
So this is a, an extraordinarily crafted uh, scene and really is very compelling and I think quite powerful the way that Spielberg set this up. Um, it would have been one thing to just have the camera on Gert the whole time. It would have been one thing to have given the speech and just watch him give the speech uh, in front of all the um, commanding officers who are about to um, evacuate the ghetto. So it's a speech, you know, a kind of rallying speech to the troops uh, before they go commit this horrific violence of rounding people up, of shooting them, of getting them essentially evacuating the ghetto. So this is a, a speech that's meant to kind of rouse his troops. But Spielberg doesn't do that. He doesn't actually watch you give him, he doesn't actually allow us to watch the speech um, given. But in fact, we see the effect of the speech by all the different places the camera goes by showing its relationship first to Schindler, his decision, which hadn't been made yet uh, to save people. He, we don't even know, you know what his position exactly is vis-a-vis um, -vis what's going to happen. Uh, we see Isaac Stern, right, who's obviously going to, his um, a central uh, mediator uh, for the uh, Schindler Jews. And we see a family in a kind of tender moment, uh, a kind of tenderness of the woman who smiles, the tenderness of the family, this domestic space. Um, all those things showing the kind of broader effect, right? The broader kind of global effect of this individual moment in history. Um, and it's again, it's kind of framed by this acoustic moment, this today is history, which is at the very beginning and the very end you have these moments where other sounds are layered on top. So these other sounds are um, people talking in the domestic spaces. You have uh, a little bit of uh, singing. You have the setting up of the chairs. All these other things that are happening, both sort of right before and right after. And all this um, essentially producing, I think, this effect of a more global history out of a singular event. So just to uh, play one more time, just to listen to the sound. <coughs> Just a couple of notes. I mean, notice the detail of the camera, the camera looking outside. Here you see all these things, the tables being set up. Just prior to that, you have the details uh, focused on the individual tables, the sounds that are associated with that, the way in which Spielberg is constantly moving between a kind of more global, larger history and the individual detail, the tiny detail, which is in many ways um, stands for the whole, right? So the way the letter on the name stands for the whole, or in this case, the table or the stamp. Let this play out a little further. <coughs> Think about that. By this evening, those six centuries are a rumor. They never happen. So that is history. So this is the connection to the next scene, which is, I'll end talking about this right now, but I want to bring this up now, is also utterly important because this is the moment now where Schindler comes back and has a very particular view on what's going to happen. This is a view that's established uh, from above as he's looking down at the event that's about to take place before his eyes. So Gert announced what was going to happen. You see the camera traveling uh, both back, sort of back in time but also kind of forward. And now you have this moment where Schindler has this perspective, we watching him look, and then we seeing as Schindler sees. So watch uh, as the camera moves. So here's the shot of Schindler. Here's the historical event that's about to happen before our eyes on the ground. Right? So this is the camera on the ground, the chaos that ensues. And what you'll see is it constantly returns back to Schindler's view, which is a view from above, as he watches it unfold, kind of the same way we watch it unfold as spectators. So we're put in his perspective of seeing like the hero in the film. So here's the event on the ground, the dogs, the stamps, the bullets, the guns, all the, the chaos. And then there's that moment of a dis, kind of disconnected viewing from above which is this viewing here. Quiet, removed, high above the city, looking down. Right? So now we're seeing, so this is the shot reverse shot thing. Here's the shot, the faces, and then we see what they're looking at. 
uh, in this case, taking us inside. But you'll see constantly we go back and forth between looking at what they're seeing and what's about to unfold in front of us. Okay, so we'll continue this, uh, our analysis on, uh, on Thursday.